if you were here last week, we talked about this tiny book um, of the minor prophets last week. We talked about the book of Hosea, if you were here. And if you remember in the book of Hosea, um, Hosea was a minor prophet, minor because it's just a tiny book. He was a prophet that the Lord actually gave him instructions to choose a wife that's a prostitute. Can you imagine that? Okay, imagine if that is happening in this season, in this generation. I think that's, that's a big scandal if that happens. But God tells Hosea to look for a wife that's a prostitute. So what he does is that he marries this woman. And when he marries this woman, to shorten the message, they actually have three kids. And after they had three kids, this woman goes back to her old lifestyle. She becomes unfaithful again. And then God tells Hosea to do five things. He says, number one, Hosea, I want you to look for her again. And the, after that, I want you to pay for all her debts. And after you've paid for all her debts, I want you to buy her back because she had been sold as a slave. I want you to buy her back. And when you buy her back, I want you to get down on one knee and propose to her again and tell her how much you love her like nothing ever happened. And finally, God says, the fifth thing I want you to do is that I want you to take her home to live with you again as if nothing ever happened. And we relayed that story to the story of our lives last week. That how much we've failed God, we've been unfaithful to Him. And yet, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He sent His Son for us. He made the effort to buy us back, to win us over. Did you know every day you can say that prayer, God, win my heart today. Win my affection today because I want to choose Jesus in everything that I do. And that's what God did for us. And last week, we talked about how He draws us in the place of the wilderness and some of you are in a wilderness situation in your life and you're in a place that you're trying to find where you're, you ought to go. But God has won your heart and you're here today. The fact that you're here, it means that you've been brought here by grace. Amen. Amen. And the fact that you're here, it means you've, you've won over 100% of your bad days. And you're here and you're strong and you're able because of the grace of God. Today, I want to take this a little bit further. I want to talk about this love, that this love relationship that God has with us. So let's move aside a little bit this whole Valentine's Day thing about the other person. And I want us to focus a little bit on the love of God. And let's, let's, can we do that together? Yes? And one of the, the most powerful images that I've had in my own life I have a picture of the first time I became a father. I think it's, it's on the slide. This is the first time that my daughter, Sevea, was actually born, okay, a, a few, about 10 years ago. And this is one of the examples that I used. You know, nobody that gives birth looks good in a picture, no? No matter what you do to smile and no matter what you do, you just don't look so good. Of course, the father did not give birth. I can smile. But my wife, she was under, you know, she was cesarean, so her smile looks so fake. And I was saying this, that the first time I became a father, I did not understand what it meant to love your child. I had no understanding of that. I knew it because my parents loved me. I knew it because there were people that I loved. But for the first time in my life, the moment I saw my little girl, Okay, and you fathers, you know this. And I was actually there in the operating room. I saw my wife's tummy open, and our OB actually agreed to that, and I had my camera. And I remember the first time they brought this little baby out of my wife's tummy, and the moment I saw the nurses lift her up by her ankles, measure her, I was there in the operating room seeing all of this happen. And I just told myself, wow, Lord, I did not know that in this heart of mine, as imperfect as I am, I did not know that there is a love that you can have for this little child that has never been existing in your heart before. And I saw her, I said, this little baby forever changed my status from being not a father into a father. And I looked at her and I, and I started to cry. I started to cry, not because my wife's tummy was open and it was bloody. I started to cry because I realized that, Lord, how can I love something or someone so much that she has not done anything for me yet? She will be unable to do anything for me. There's no performance that she can do in her life. And I remember writing this in my journal, that, Lord, how can this be 
that a tiny little baby that can do nothing for me, I love her to the point that I'm willing to lay down my life for her. And a father or a mother would know this. And a lot of us, we grew up in a punishment and reward system, isn't it? We grew up in a family, and if you do good, you get a star. If you grew up in kids' church, you do good. You memorize the verse. They reward you. You do bad. They punish you. Because of this reward and punishment system, what happened to us is that we started to grow up thinking that in all things, it's a reward and punishment system. And that may be true even in the business world, but in our relationship with God, because of His grace, the reward and punishment system is so different. It doesn't work that way. But the problem is this, we have a lot of Christians that come here, give their lives to Jesus, but they're still living in bondage. They're still living in a performance-based relationship. Oh Lord, if I don't do my devotions enough, I, I, I don't think I'm worthy. If I, if I made this mistake, if I made that mistake, Lord, I, I don't think I'm okay and I'm worthy. And this whole time, there's a condemnation in your life. I don't know about you, but have you felt that, that you go to church you're a part of a life group. You go about your day. But there's a low-grade guilt in your life. It's, it's like, see, not a low-grade fever. You know, there's just a tiny layer of guilt that you feel like, Lord, I didn't pray enough. I didn't read my Bible enough. I didn't do as good as I should have. I said a bad word, Lord. I did a wrong thing. And every day, a tiny layer of guilt is over your life. I don't know about you, but I've felt that for years and I was just living under that guilt. And when you have a low-grade fever, kaya pa, no? you can work. So let's say you, you go to work, you have a low-grade fever. You can always say, no, I can do it. But you see, the low-grade fever every day as the temperature would increase, you get weaker and weaker and weaker. And that's what happens when you're a Christian and there's this low-grade guilt over your life. You just feel condemned. You just feel that you don't amount to anything. Did you know that that's not how God sees you? That's not the relationship that he had for you. He sees you differently. He, he's not like your father. He's not like your mother. He's like nobody here on earth. He's different in the way that he loves. He's not a performance-based God. He's a God that loves you with an everlasting kind of love. Amen. Are you still with me? And don't carry that reward and punishment system into the kingdom of God. Because when you live like that, you cannot worship. When you live like that, you don't. You come to the Bible and say, Lord, sige na lang, I'll just read to make up for the times that I did not read. And guess what? If you come to the Word of God with that attitude, you will not get anything from the Word of God. You have to be in a place, and Lord, I am a child of God. And Lord, as your child, you as my Father, you speak to me. You can speak to me. You can change me. You can bring me to another level. So Lord, I'm going to get into your Word today. Regardless of how I perform, I'm going to get into your word today and I'm going to trust that as I read, you will speak because that is who you are to me. So come to the word of God without that reward and punishment system. I want to take you today to this reality of how God loves us. First John, go with me to First John 4, starting in verse 7. And let me just say a few things about this. It says here, beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. In other words, the writer, uh, of course, John was saying this, the very litmus test of whether you're a Christian, a Christian is a follower of Jesus, the litmus test of your Christianity is if you're able to love others. That's what he was saying. If you profess that you're a Christian, but you don't know how to love others, you're not a Christian. That's what John was saying, and that's a very painful thing to say. And all of us are works in progress. And he continues to say, the next verse, if you would show it, verse 8. He continues to say, he who does not love does not know God. Can you imagine how painful that is? John was saying, if you don't know how to love, you don't know God. But John, I go to church, but if you don't know how to love, you don't know God. I attend Bible studies. I memorize scripture. If you don't know how to love, you don't know God. Ouch. If you don't know how to love your wife, you don't know how to love your husband, your children, the way that God loves them, you really, really don't know God. 
You can be a worship leader and still have no love. You can be a pastor and still have no love. In other words, John was saying, that is proof of whether you are a Jesus follower or not. That's why I love to study the life of Jesus. How did Jesus respond to people that came to him, that ruined his schedule, that messed up his time? People, that crowds that came to him pulling on his garment. How did Jesus respond? Because everything he did was love personified and that's how Jesus is. So John continues to say this. He says a powerful statement. He says here, he who does not know God, go, go back to that verse. He who does not know God, verse 8, okay. He who does not love does not know God. And then he begins to say, for God has love. Does it say God shows love? No, he says a very powerful statement. He says, no, because God is love. And when you say God is love, it means that love is God. God is love personified. Therefore, when he sent his son Jesus, he sent his love to you and to me. And today, I want to look at that reality of that God is love. And then he begins to define what love is. Look at this really quickly. Verse 9. In this, the love of God was manifested. Okay, have you ever gone on a date here? Let's be honest. Come on, raise your hands. You married, not married. You gone on a date. Come on, raise your hands. Don't be ashamed. It's okay to go on a date. It's okay. Okay. Right when you go on a date and it's your first time, we have what we call your, your best foot forward, right? It's best foot forward all the time. You bring the best version of yourself to the woman that you really like or to the man that you really like. Amen. Correct. And if you're a lady and it's your first time, the truth is even if you're so hungry, you don't want to eat a lot, right? And in a date you're ne in, a, in a date, and it's a first time, you never really are full, right? You're just wiping your mouth, drinking your drink. You don't finish your drink. You don't finish your food, and you're just talking. But the truth is when you get home, you're going to eat a lot when you get home, right? That's how it is in a date because you're trying to measure each other, and it's your best foot forward, Correct? And I love watching couples do that, and you know they're going on for the first time. It's so awkward. It's so weird. There's a lot of dead air. Uh, so, uh, what do you do? And uh, so, and it's all small conversations and small talk, correct? When John writes this, this is what he was saying. Now we get the best foot forward. This is what he was saying. God being an all-powerful being, he had his, at his disposal, any way that he could show us love. But he chose to show the magnitude and the enormity of his love through one thing. It's him sending his son for us. That's the point of John. The best foot forward of God, the best effort of God, so to speak, is to show my love for humanity through how, how. He says, I'm going to send my son Jesus for broken humanity and I'm going to manifest this love and it says here that God has sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. It's God saying my best foot forward to show you my love is not to just make you feel love. It's the word becoming flesh. It's Jesus becoming real. I'm sending my son to you so that you can have a newness of life. Are you still tracking with me? Yes. And when he sent his son, Jesus, we now have a second chance at life. We now begin to walk in the newness of life. When you believe in Jesus Christ, maybe you're here for the first time, and we passionately talk about Jesus. Because really, as we follow Jesus and we give our lives to him, he changes us from the inside out. Amen. And with this, John begins to paint a picture of what God has done by showing his love for us. Okay, God is love. Can you tell the person beside you, God is love? And today I'm going to talk about that love that is God and that God that is love. Amen. And we're going to land this thing in one chapter in the Bible. How many of you know 1 Corinthians 13? Yes, it's a famous love chapter. But can we agree today that when we look at 1 Corinthians 13, we're not going to imagine our love for our spouse or their love for us. We're going to look at it from God's love toward us. Is that okay? Okay. 1 Corinthians 13. We're going to make it extra special today. I'm going to draw from the Passion Translation because I love it in the TPT. It's so fresh. Are you ready? Yes. 
God's love toward us. In this verse, we can replace the word love with the name God because that is who he is. God is love. And look at how it says, and we'll go through this little by little. It says here, love is large and incredibly patient. What a beautiful opening statement. What's the first definition of love, Paul writes? Love is large and incredibly patient. Do you know what patient is, what patience is? Patience is so powerful. You know what it means? Patience is, I'm willing to go at the same pace that you're going. I'm not going to be too fast. I'm not going to be too slow. I'm going to discover your pace and walk your pace. I'm going to adjust. Whether I need to speed up or slow down, that's what patience is. And that's powerful if you think of it how God loves us. The processes that you have in your life, the journey, the race that you're running, it's according to your pace. God doesn't compare you with another pastor. Brian, why are you not doing as well as Pastor Joe? Why are you not growing as fast as Pastor Grace? No, God is patient toward you. And he's saying, the process I have for you, Brian, is at your pace because I'm patient toward you. And imagine how powerful that is if it's with your spouse or with the person that you love. In other words, love is not pushy are you pushy as a person do you push people toward a direction because love doesn't do that love says I'm going to discover your pace and I'm going to walk in stride with you because I'm patient with you isn't that powerful and God is telling you today I'm not going to push you into something or force you into anything I'm patient with you and that is the type of love that I have I don't compare you with another. I compare you with you and I grow you at your rate because my love for you is patient. And you know another way to say it? A patient person accommodates the pace of another person. You know our problem is as individuals, li like me in the mall, sometimes I have the tendency to walk ahead of my wife. And anyone like that? Right? You're talking and you're alone and you're still talking and your wife is there looking at clothes, fixing her hair. And you're just talking the whole time and you're wondering, where, where? honey, what are you budget? And you bring her back and then we walk again and then you walk at a pace. You know why that happens? You know how selfish we are as people? You know what's normal to us in our pace? What's normal to us is our own pace. And we measure everyone at our pace. We think our pace is normal. And if we're slower than others or faster than others, we think they're abnormal. Correct? Okay. In your household, there's usually one that's faster and one that's slower. I don't know your story. If your wife is faster than you or you're married to a man that's very slow. I don't want to talk about that. You might end up fighting in this service, in a love service. I don't want you to fight. There are some people, there's always one slower and one faster. But patience is, I'm going to discover your pace and slow down at your pace. I'm willing to make adjustments on your behalf because I'm patient with you. And you know why you can do that to one another? Because Christ did that for you. Amen. Even Peter writes that, he is not slow in keeping his promises as some understand slowness. No, he is patient with you. In fact, he's so patient, the Bible says, so that none should perish. He exercises his patience. Wow, this is the first definition palang, and we're already sold to this kind of love. He is patient with you. Can you tell the person beside you, I'm going to be patient? Some of you didn't even look at the person next to you. You didn't even care. Huh, patient. Okay, some of you probably got into a fight, husbands and wives, no? Honey, we're late, we're late. And there's no more patience and love in the house. Next, okay? Look at this, powerful. Love is in large and incredibly patient. The next definition is this. Why is media so fast? We're still in the second part. Okay, it's, this is powerful. Love is gentle and consistently kind to all. Wow. Love is gentle and consistently kind to all. One of my most favorite Psalms is Psalm 18. Okay, David in Psalm 18, the background of Psalm 18 is that David was on top of the world. He had won all his battles in his life. 
He had succeeded in battles. Every victory. In, in front of him there was victory. Behind him there was victory. In his sides there was victory. And in, his, in Psalm 18 verse 35, David gives us the secret of what made him a great king. And this is what he says. Can you show me Psalm 18 um, if you have it up there in the slide? Look, listen to this church. You have also given me the shield of your salvation. And David continues to say about God, your right hand has held me up. And look at this, the secret to my greatness, David says, Lord, your gentleness toward me has made me great. That Lord, even in my weakness, you were gentle toward me. Even in my frailty, you loved me. Oh, husband and, husbands and wives, are you gentle with one another? Is there still gentleness in the tone of your voice? Or are you easily irritated? Imagine if God was like that with us. You come to God, Lord, forgive me. Wow, forgive me. You've been coming to the altar for 15 years for the same thing. You call me back when you're done with that, okay? Imagine if God was like that. You just call me when you're okay. No, he's gentle toward you and he's consistently kind. You know what kindness is? You know what gentleness is? gentleness is you stop highlighting the weakness of the person instead you pour out strength over the person in the area that he's weak are you kind because God's been kind to us you know my standing here is his kindness I don't deserve to be in the spotlight but he says Brian in your weakness I've allowed you to stand so don't forget that that's why the older generation would always tell the younger generation, don't forget your roots. Don't forget where you've come from. Don't forget that where we started, because where we started will determine how humble you are when you're well off. Amen. And God is saying in, in the definition of love, he says, I've been patient toward you, Brian. I've been kind to you, church. And I've restored you to a place that you don't deserve because that's how I love. That is the definition of the covenant love of God. Amen. Can we continue? Are you still with me? Yes? Okay. We're still together. Next, can we go back to that slide about 1 Corinthians 13? We're still in, in the first batch. He says here, it refuses to be jealous when blessing comes to someone else. Love does not brag about one's achievements nor inflate its own importance. Let me pause here for a while. Look at this, the definition of God's love for us. He's saying, Brian, you don't deserve to be in a spotlight, but I'm allowing you to stand in the spotlight because it's your time to shine. I'm allowing you to shine and not stepping in to make myself shine, but I'm allowing you to shine. Are you like that with your spouse? You brag about her or you brag about him because that's what love does. It never highlights the weakness, but it showcases a person's strength. And that's what God was saying here. The way I love you, Brian, eh, the way I died for you is that I want to give you a chance to even stand in a place that not, you're not worthy to stand because I love you and because I love you. And I'm going to allow you to showcase the gifts that I've given you, not because you're great, but because I've been so good to you. I'm going to brag about not my achievements, but yours. I'm going to show my strength through who? Through you. What a privilege. And with our relationships, are we like this? Do we celebrate when someone else gets blessed? Isn't that hard? You pray for something and the exact same prayer, it was given to someone else. Has that happened to you? right? You pray for a car and someone else gets the car. You pray for a promotion, someone else gets the promotion. You pray for the one that you want to marry and then your best friend gets married ahead of you, right? But you know what love does? Love says, I'm willing to celebrate your joy and your victory and I'm willing to put you in the spotlight so that you can shine because it's your moment that's what love does it builds another person you know why we can do that Jesus did that for you amen are you still tracking with me some of you are just staring at me 
I mean, this love is passionate. It's real. It's powerful. It's tangible. And let's continue with what God says here. Let's go to the next. Look at this. Love does not traffic in shame and disrespect. Wow. Love does not traffic in shame and disrespect. In God's relationship with us, you'll never find God putting you to shame because of the wrong that you've done. In fact, Jesus said in his own words that he died for you, not only your sin, but your shame. That he paid the price for you, not only your sin, but your shame. Here's a good question. In our relationships, do we smuggle in things in our relationships? Do we smuggle sin into our relationship? Do we smuggle shame into our relationships? Do we smuggle different things like disrespect into our relationships? And I love the word that is used in the Passion Translation that we traffic in. Because normally a relationship that's strong stays strong until one of them traffics in something new that undermines the relationship. And boy, oh boy, is God looking at you today and he's saying, my child, you will never find me put you to shame. No, I've died for you and I've given you a new life and I'm going to make sure that not only the sin is dealt with in your life, but I'm also going to deal with the shame. And I've seen this many times in this generation. The youth that have been so broken, so hurt, and so fragmented because of the families that they grew up in. And I'd tell them, you know what? That shame that you carry is not from God. That shame is from the enemy because the God that you serve loves you like no other. And you can be yourself in his presence. You could stand and be you in his presence and watch him change you in the process. Love does not traffic in shame and disrespect. And this is a powerful word. Nor seek its own, nor selfishly seek its own honor. Do you agree with me? Honor is a word that we rarely use in this generation. Yes. R honor is so rare that a generation ago, two generations ago, they understood honor. But this generation, we don't understand honor. In fact, even Cebuanos don't understand honor. The young people that talk to the older people, there's no po in opo system here, right? I, I got shocked when I first came here because I'm so used to saying po and opo to the older ones in Manila. Here it's different. doesn't matter what age you are. The way they talk to the older ones, there's, there's no respect almost, right? The body language, there's no respect. There's no sir and ma'am. And it's just so rough, correct? And that's what Paul was saying right here. He says, love will always seek to honor. You know what honor is? Let me give it to you in a brief definition. You know what honor is? Is thinking that somebody is more valuable than you. Am I saying that they are? No, I'm saying treating them as they are. You know why you can do that? Because God did that for you. Amen. He died on the cross for you. Treating you as valuable, giving his own son for you so that you can do that for someone else. That's what honor is. Are you still with me? Love honors. Love brings up the value of a person even if the person is less valuable than you. Love automatically says sir and ma'am and po and opo because they recognize that you are of higher value than I am. Amen. And Jesus did that for you. His love honors you. And I said this in the youth, just a segue. If you're here, you're a single person, and you're about to date or get into a relationship, number one, be transparent about your intent because transparency is honoring to a lady. It honors the person. Be transparent to your parents. Why? Because being transparent honors your parents. Are you following me? It's powerful when you get people on your side because you're transparent. Instead of them going against you, they cheer you on because transparency and openness is 
honoring to a person. Oh, I pray that you and I get this because when you honor somebody, it makes God happy. It brings people to another level. Did you know that Jesus lived that way? You'll never read a story of Jesus wherein he brought out the God card. Jesus never walked into a restaurant and said, hey, uh, I want that table because Jesus is here. I, I deserve the best. You'll never see a story of Jesus that he sat at the highest chair in the table just because he is God. And he says, no, I'm God. I deserve the seat. In fact, in Philippians, Paul says, Jesus did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped. He took the form of a servant. In the likeness of sinful man, he even was obedient until the cross. Jesus never played the God card. You and I should never play the God card. That I'm a Christian, I deserve more. I don't. You, a person with a sense of entitlement is never a grateful person. Yes, a person that's grateful has no sense of entitlement. Lord, whatever you give me, thank you, Chayu, Lord. Thank you for your blessing. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for sustaining me. I'm grateful. There's no sense of entitlement. It's honoring unto the Lord. His love honors you. And look at this. Love is not easily irritated or quick to take offense. Are you easily offended? Because God is not. Are you easily irritated? Do slow people irritate you? Please don't raise your hands if you're married. Maybe your irritation is seated next to you. Please don't do that. I don't want you to fight. But love is not easily irritated. God is not up in heaven tapping his foot. What is wrong with my son? Why does he keep sinning? Why is he doing something wrong? Instead, what God does is that I'm going to come and I'm going to make sure that everything around you will fall into place so that everything will conform you. The trials that you face, the wilderness that you're going through, it's going to shape you to become more like my son, Jesus. Love is not easily irritated. It is never ever quick to get, uh, to get offended. Are you following me? And let's move on to this before the SMs kill me because I don't have uh, so much time. And look at what it says here. God's love, it joyfully celebrates honesty and finds no delight in what is wrong. In other translations, love keeps no record of wrongs. God is not up in heaven with a list. Okay, I wonder if he's going to do right today. Up, oh, wrong. He didn't do this, wrong. God does not keep a record of our wrongs. Amen. In fact, in Psalm 103, it says that God, okay, in his kindness and in his love, does not treat us as our sins deserve. Instead, he says, but as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love toward us. He's not, he's not a score-keeping God. He's a grace-giving God. He doesn't keep a record of wrongs. Are you married to someone that keeps a record of wrongs? Are you married to a wife that's not only hysterical but historical? You know, they remember. It's funny, you know, but it's true. Sometimes women have the tendency to do that, but excuse me, men also have the tendency to do that. When we're hysterical, we become historical. We remember the wrongs that they've done. He remembered this time, and you don't even remember, right? You don't even remember. They remember what you were wearing, how you smelled, what happened, who was there. And you're wondering, really? I thought we're done with this. No, I remember, blah, 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 blah. But God is never historical with us. God is always in the present and always forgiving in the future. Amen. He keeps no record of wrongs. So I hope today when you come and worship Him, know that God, He can remember all the things that we've done wrong, but He chooses not to. As far as the east is from the west, so far as He removed your tra our transgressions from us. Amen. And let's continue with this definition of love and we'll wrap up soon. I love it. Let's go back to the verse. Come on, media, work with me here. All right, there you go. Next verse, verse 7. Look at this. Love is a safe place of shelter. Because you and I are loved, we can run to our strong tower, that is Jesus Christ. And it's a safe place. 
You can tell him your deepest, darkest secrets and it's never going to leak because his brand of love protects your reputation. It's a safe place. Have you met people that are not safe places? That's not how God operates. He loves you and he's a safe place. Look at this. I love this part. It never stops believing the best for others. Did you know that God doesn't grade you based on how well you do now? No, He grades you based on the potential of what you can become. He doesn't see where you are now. He sees what you can become. When I see my children, I don't just see how they're living now. I see the potential of what they can become in the future. He calls the things that are not as though they are. Because love chooses, chooses, because love is a choice. It chooses to see the best. Never the worst, but the best. Love never takes failure as defeat. I love this so much that because He loves you so much, the failure in your life is not a period. It's just a comma. There's something more. When you fail, God is saying, no, don't think that your story ends there. It's not a period. It's just a comma. You're a work in progress. Your failure is not your defeat. Your failure is just my process to make you more like my son, Jesus, because my love chooses to see the best in you. I love that. And look at the last line. Love never gives up. Did you know that His love for you never gives up on you? Even when you've given up on yourself, God says, I love you and I'm never going to give up on you. I'm going to keep changing you, keep transforming you. I'm going to run after you and I'm going to make sure that you become a different person. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Did you love that? And here's the wrap-up of the last line that I want you to see. In verse 8, I have one slide for that. Can you show me that last line? And I love the Passion Translation. My slide, I have a last slide that I showed you. This is what it says. Love never stops loving. Beautiful translation. Don't you agree? In other translation, it says love never, love never fails. But here in this translation, it says... Love never stops loving. You mean to say, Brian, that even when I was sinning at my worst, His love was still the same? Yes. That's why the verse says, while you were yet sinners, Christ died for you. You mean to say, even at the point of my sin, when I was darkest and when I was most hopeless? Yes, because love never stops loving I don't know about you but when I read this suddenly I felt secured in where I stand in God's eyes because he chooses to see the best he never ever highlights my failure he may remind me of my failure because of the Holy Spirit but it's a gentle reminder it's never a condemning reminder it's gentle it makes you change do I still have time I do. Just one minute, two minutes. Can I just wrap it up really quick? Do you remember when Jesus, I want to take this home with Jesus. Do you remember when Jesus was sent to be crucified? You remember the story. Christmas was just a few months ago. We, we, we talked about the reason for the season. Do you remember the story when Peter stood up with his chest out and he says, Jesus, you're not going to die. No way. You're not going to be crucified. And Jesus said, Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. You don't know what you're talking about. He put Peter in his place. And he, Peter even says, no, everyone else will deny you. But I'm never going to deny you. Do you remember that? And if you read the Bible account again, when Jesus was being brought into the, to, into the court to, be, to, be, to have a conversation with Pontius Pilate, there was a scene that the Bible says as Jesus is being dragged, Peter and Jesus, their eyes met. And when their eyes met, Peter had wept bitterly because he had denied him three times. He made a promise to do something and he failed. Do you remember that? He did not deny Jesus once, not even twice, but thrice. Have you done that to Jesus? You made a promise and you kept doing and repeating that weakness and that sin. Doesn't it feel condemning, right? 
And when Peter saw Jesus and his eyes met Jesus, the Bible says he wept bitterly. And imagine if we fast forward the story, Jesus actually was nailed on the cross and he actually dies. Can you imagine how Peter felt? The man that I followed for three years, that I promised to never deny, he actually died on the cross. And I betrayed him. And not only that, I denied him three times. Can you imagine what Peter felt? I didn't get a chance to make it right. I tried to make, of course, none of them knew that he was going to resurrect. They never believed it until it happened. But Peter was so wrecked and so broken to the point that Peter went back fishing. If you remember, end of John when he writes, John 20 and 21. Peter goes back fishing. Why? Because that's the only thing he knows what to do. Peter goes back fishing and all night they couldn't catch fish. And look at the grace of Jesus. Jesus walks into the shore and he calls out and he says, my children. I love that. They all deserted him and he still calls them his children. He says, my children, have you caught no fish? And none of them recognized that it was Jesus. They said, none. And then when Jesus said, put down your nets again, John suddenly recognized that it was Jesus. And John removed his outer garment, swam to the shore. Uh, Peter removed his outer garment, swam to the shore. But it was John who recognized him. It's the Lord. It's the Master. And here comes Peter again, a second chance. I get to talk to him again. He died, but he rose again. He removes his garment, swims to Jesus. And when he gets to shore, he even brings all the catch of fish. And that's a section in the book of John that's so powerful. Listen to this. While they were all eating, Jesus isolates Peter. The same way that sin isolated Peter, Jesus isolates Peter. And he looks Peter in the eye. Remember this story. And he says, Peter, do you love me? Remember that? And Peter, with all the shame, he says, Lord, you know I love you. I can imagine Peter in his impatience, he's bouncing and saying, Lord, I, I love you. And Jesus looks at him again and he says, Peter, do you love me? And can you imagine what he must have felt knowing that the last time they talked, he denied Jesus. And he said, Peter, do you love me? And Peter again, mustering up the courage, he tells Jesus, Jesus, I love you. And a third time, Jesus asks Peter, Peter, do you love me? And Peter, you can tell he was hurt. He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And then he says, then feed my sheep. You know what Jesus was doing? The three denials of the past. He was breaking the three denials. Peter, the same mouth that denied me. I'm going to make sure that that mouth will begin to say that it loves me three times. I'm going to break the bondage of that sin in your life. And I'm going to reverse it. And with the same mouth that you denied me, I'm going to make that mouth declare that it loves me. And you see what type of love Jesus has for us when Peter said that that was the verse that Jesus says Peter upon this rock I will build my church Lord really I'm the failure I'm the broken one I'm the one who denied you Jesus says I'm done with that upon this rock Peter I will build my church I don't judge you based on what you've done I see you now in what you can become because that's how God loves you today and I don't know what you're carrying at this moment in your life but he's reversing the curse the sin the bondage the things that make you ugly he's reversing it because he loves you amen father how humbling it is to be on this side of eternity how humbling it is to be a recipient of your love and your grace. And yet you still love. Totally, Lord God, undeserved and yet you still love. Oh Lord, how gracious you've been that you would even take the time to process us at our own pace. To grow us at our own pace. To choose to see the best. To keep no record of wrongs, Lord. What a gracious and loving Heavenly Father you are. So Lord, today, this month of February, 
I'm deciding to give you back that love. The love that you've so given to us, I give back to you. I give to you my weaknesses. I give to you my failures. I give to you whatever my past is and whatever decisions that I've made that have undermined my relationship with you. I surrender that to you. Lord, at this moment, can you embrace me again and restore to me that love again? Because show me today that your love is patient and it's kind. It never boasts. It's not envy. It's not proud. It keeps no record of wrongs. It's not easily offended. It's not easily um, irritated. Lord, your love, it always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. And it always perseveres. Love keeps on loving. Lord, Lord, I thank you for that kind of love. I give you this day. This month of February, I'm going to love others better. I'm going to love my spouse better. I'm going to love my children better. I'm going to love others better. God, I thank you and I honor you today. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Can everybody say this? Amen and amen. God bless you.